Book Three, Part One of the Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. The Annals by Publius Cornelius Tacitus, Volume One. Translated by Alfred John Church and William Jackson Broderib. Book Three, A.D. Twenty to Twenty Two, Part One. Without pausing in her winter voyage, Agrippina arrived at the island of Corsaira, facing the shores of Calabria. There she spent a few days to compose her mind, for she was wild with grief and knew not how to endure. Meanwhile, on hearing of her arrival, all her intimate friends and several officers, every one, indeed, who had served under Germanicus, many strangers, too, from the neighbouring towns, some thinking it respectful to the emperor, and still more following their example, thronged eagerly to Brundisium, the nearest and safest landing-place for a voyager. As soon as the fleet was seen on the horizon, not only the harbour and the adjacent shores, but the city walls too, and the roofs, and every place which commanded the most distant prospect, were filled with crowds of mourners, who incessantly asked one another whether, when she landed, they were to receive her in silence, or with some utterance of emotion. They were not agreed on what befitted the occasion, when the fleet slowly approached, its crew not joyous as is usual, but wearing all a studied expression of grief. When Agrippina descended from the vessel with her two children, clasping the funeral urn, with eyes riveted to the earth, there was one universal groan. You could not distinguish kinsfolk from strangers, or the laments of men from those of women, only the attendants of Agrippina, worn out as they were by long sorrow, were surpassed by the mourners who now met them, fresh in their grief. The emperor had dispatched two praetorian cohorts, with instructions that the magistrates of Calabria, Apulia, and Campania were to pay the last honours to his son's memory. Accordingly, tribunes and centurions bore Germanicus's ashes on their shoulders. They were preceded by the standards unadorned and the fasces reversed. As they passed colony after colony, the populace in black, the knights in their state robes, burnt vestments and perfumes with other funeral adjuncts in proportion to the wealth of the place. Even those whose towns were out of the route met the mourners, offered victims, and built altars to the dead, testifying their grief by tears and wailings. Drusus went as far as Tarasina with Claudius, brother of Germanicus, and the children who had been at Rome. Marcus Valerius and Gaius Aurelius, the consuls, who had already entered on office, and a great number of the people thronged the road in scattered groups, every one weeping as he felt inclined. Flattery there was none, for all knew that Tiberius could scarcely dissemble his joy at the death of Germanicus. Tiberius and Augusta refrained from showing themselves, thinking it below their dignity to shed tears in public, or else fearing that, if all eyes scrutinized their faces, their hypocrisy would be revealed. I do not find in any historian or in the daily register that Antonia, Germanicus's mother, rendered any conspicuous honour to the deceased, though besides Agrippina, Drusus, and Claudius, all his other kinsfolk are mentioned by name. She may either have been hindered by illness, or with a spirit overpowered by grief, she may not have had the heart to endure the sight of so great an affliction. But I can more easily believe that Tiberius and Augusta, who did not leave the palace, kept her within, 
that their sorrow might seem equal to hers, and that the grandmother and uncle might be thought to follow the mother's example in staying at home. The day on which the remains were consigned to the tomb of Augustus was now desolate in its silence, now distracted by lamentations. The streets of the city were crowded, torches were blazing throughout the campus marshes. There the soldiers under arms, the magistrates without their symbols of office, the people in the tribes, were all incessantly exclaiming that the commonwealth was ruined, that not a hope remained, too boldly and openly to let one think that they remembered their rulers. But nothing impressed Tiberius more deeply than the enthusiasm kindled in favour of Agrippina, whom men spoke of as the glory of the country, the sole surviving offspring of Augustus, the solitary example of the old times. While looking up to heaven and the gods, they prayed for the safety of her children, and that they might outlive their oppressors. Some there were who missed the grandeur of a state funeral, and contrasted the splendid honours conferred by Augustus on Drusus, the father of Germanicus. Then the emperor himself, they said, went in the extreme rigour of winter as far as Ticinum, and never leaving the corpse entered Rome with it. Round the funeral bier were ranged the images of the Claudii and the Julii, there was weeping in the forum, and a panegyric before the rostra. Every honour devised by our ancestors, or invented by their descendants, was heaped on him. But as for Germanicus, even the customary distinctions due to any noble had not fallen to his lot. Granting that his body, because of the distance of the journey, was burnt in any fashion in foreign lands, Still all the more honours ought to have been afterwards paid him, because at first chance had denied them. His brother had gone but one day's journey to meet him, his uncle not even to the city gates. Where were all those usages of the past, the image at the head of the bier, the lays composed in commemoration of worth, the eulogies and laments, or at least the semblance of grief. All this was known to Tiberius, and, to silence popular talk, he reminded the people in a proclamation that many eminent Romans had died for their country, and that none had been honoured with such passionate regret. This regret was a glory both to himself and to all, provided only a due mean were observed for what was becoming in humble homes and communities did not befit princely personages and an imperial people. Tears and the solace found in mourning were suitable enough for the first burst of grief, but now they must brace their hearts to endurance, as in former days the divine Julius, after the loss of his only daughter, and the divine Augustus, when he was bereft of his grandchildren, had thrust away their sorrow. There was no need of examples from the past, showing how often the Roman people had patiently endured the defeats of armies, the destruction of generals, the total extinction of noble families. Princes were mortal, the state was everlasting. Let them then return to their usual pursuits, and as the shows of the festival of the great goddess were at hand, even resume their amusements. The suspension of business then ceased, and men went back to their occupations. Drusus was sent to the armies of Illyricum, amidst an universal eagerness to exact vengeance on Piso, and ceaseless complaints that he was meantime roaming through the delightful regions of Asia and Achaia, and was weakening the proofs of his guilt by an insolent and artful procrastination. It was indeed widely rumoured that the notorious poisoner Martina, who, as I have related, had been dispatched to Rome by Cnaeus Sentius, had died suddenly at Brundisium, that poison was concealed in a knot of her hair, 
and that no symptoms of suicide were discovered on her person. Piso, meanwhile, sent his son on to Rome with a message intended to pacify the emperor, and then made his way to Drusus, who would, he hoped, be not so much infuriated at his brother's death, as kindly disposed towards himself in consequence of a rival's removal. Tiberius, to show his impartiality, received the youth courteously, and enriched him with the liberality he usually bestowed on the sons of noble families. Drusus replied to Piso that if certain insinuations were true, he must be foremost in his resentment, but he preferred to believe that they were false and groundless, and that Germanicus's death need be the ruin of no one. This he said openly, avoiding anything like secrecy. Men did not doubt that his answer was prescribed him by Tiberius, inasmuch as one who had generally all the simplicity and candour of youth now had recourse to the artifices of old age. Piso, after crossing the Dalmatian Sea and leaving his ships at Ancona, went through Picenum and along the Flaminian Road, where he overtook a legion which was marching from Pannonia to Rome, and was then to garrison Africa. It was a matter of common talk how he had repeatedly displayed himself to the soldiers on the road during the march. From Narnia, to avoid suspicion, or because the plans of fear are uncertain, he sailed down the Nar, then down the Tiber, and increased the fury of the populace by bringing his vessel to shore at the tomb of the Caesars. In broad daylight, when the river bank was thronged, he himself, with a numerous following of dependents, and Plancino with a retinue of women, moved onward with joy in their countenances. Among other things which provoked men's anger was his house, towering above the forum, gay with festal decorations, his banquets, and his feasts, about which there was no secrecy, because the place was so public. Next day, Falcinius Trio asked the consul's leave to prosecute Piso. It was contended against him by Vitellius and Veranius, and the others who had been the companions of Germanicus, that this was not Trio's proper part, and that they themselves meant to report their instructions from Germanicus, not as accusers, but as deponents and witnesses to facts. Trio, abandoning the prosecution on this count, obtained leave to accuse Piso's previous career, and the emperor was requested to undertake the inquiry. This even the accused did not refuse, fearing as he did the bias of the people and of the senate, while Tiberius, he knew, was resolute enough to despise report, and was also entangled in his mother's complicity. Truth, too, would be more easily distinguished from perverse misrepresentation by a single judge, where a number would be swayed by hatred and ill-will. Tiberius was not unaware of the formidable difficulty of the inquiry, and of the rumours by which he was himself assailed. Having therefore summoned a few intimate friends, he listened to the threatening speeches of the prosecutors and to the pleadings of the accused and finally referred the whole case to the Senate. Drusus, meanwhile, on his return from Illyricum, though the Senate had voted him an ovation for the submission of Maruboduus and the successes of the previous summer, postponed the honour and entered Rome. Then the defendant sought the advocacy of Lucius Arruntius, Marcus Vinicius, Asinius Gallus, Isoninus Marcellus and Sextus Pompeius, and on their declining for different reasons, Marcus Lepidus, Lucius Piso, and Livinius Regulus became his counsel, amid the excitement of the whole country, which wondered how much fidelity would be shown by the friends of Germanicus, on what the accused rested his hopes, and how far Tiberius would repress and hide his feelings. Never were the people more keenly interested, 
Never did they indulge themselves more freely in secret whispers against the emperor or in the silence of suspicion. On the day the senate met, Tiberius delivered a speech of studied moderation. Piso, he said, was my father's representative and friend, and was appointed by myself on the advice of the senate to assist Germanicus in the administration of the East. Whether he there had provoked the young prince by wilful opposition and rivalry, and had rejoiced at his death, or wickedly destroyed him, is for you to determine with minds unbiased. Certainly if a subordinate oversteps the bounds of duty and of obedience to his commander, and has exulted in his death and in my affliction, I shall hate him and exclude him from my house, and I shall avenge a personal quarrel without resorting to my power as emperor. If, however, a crime is discovered which ought to be punished, whoever the murdered man may be, it is for you to give just reparation both to the children of Germanicus and to us, his parents. Consider this, too, whether Piso dealt with the armies in a revolutionary and seditious spirit, whether he sought by intrigue popularity with the soldiers, whether he attempted to repossess himself of the province by arms, or whether these are falsehoods which his accusers have published with exaggeration. As for them, I am justly angry with their intemperate zeal. For to what purpose did they strip the corpse, and expose it to the pollution of the vulgar gaze, and circulate a story among foreigners that he was destroyed by poison, if all this is still doubtful and requires investigation. For my part I sorrow for my son, and shall always sorrow for him. Still I would not hinder the accused from producing all the evidence which can relieve his innocence, or convict Germanicus of any unfairness, if such there was. And I implore you not to take as proven charges alleged, merely because the case is intimately bound up with my affliction. Do you, whom ties of blood or your own true-heartedness have made his advocates, help him in his peril, every one of you, as far as each man's eloquence and diligence can do so? To like exertions and like persistency I would urge the prosecutors. In this, and in this only, will we place Germanicus above the laws, by conducting the inquiry into his death in this house instead of in the forum, and before the senate instead of before a bench of judges. In all else let the case be tried as simply as others. Let no one heed the tears of Drusus, or my own sorrow, or any stories invented to our discredit. Two days were then assigned for the bringing forward of the charges, and after six days' interval the prisoner's defence was to occupy three days. Thereupon Fulcinius Trio began with some old and irrelevant accusations about intrigues and extortion during Piso's government of Spain. This, if proved, would not have been fatal to the defendant if he cleared himself as to his late conduct, and, if refuted, would not have secured his acquittal if he were convicted of the greater crimes. Next, Servius, Veranius, and Vitellius, all with equal earnestness, Vitellius with striking eloquence, alleged against Piso that out of hatred of Germanicus and a desire of revolution, he had so corrupted the common soldiers by license and oppression of the allies, that he was called by the vilest of them, Father of the Legions, while on the other hand to all the best men, especially to the companions and friends of Germanicus, he had been savagely cruel. Lastly, he had, they said, destroyed Germanicus himself by sorceries and poison, and hence came those ceremonies and horrible sacrifices made by himself and Plancina, then he had threatened the state with war, and had been defeated in battle, before he could be tried as a prisoner. On all points but one the defence broke down. 
that he had tampered with the soldiers, that his province had been at the mercy of the vilest of them, that he had even insulted his chief, he could not deny. It was only the charge of poisoning from which he seemed to have cleared himself. This, indeed, the prosecutors did not adequately sustain by merely alleging that at a banquet given by Germanicus his food had been tainted with poison by the hands of Piso, who sat next above him. It seemed absurd to suppose that he would have dared such an attempt among strange servants, in the sight of so many bystanders, and under Germanicus's own eyes. And, besides, the defendant offered his slaves to the torture, and insisted on its application to the attendants on that occasion. But the judges, for different reasons, were merciless. The emperor, because war had been made on a province, the senate, because they could not be sufficiently convinced that there had been no treachery about the death of Germanicus. At the same time shouts were heard from the people in front of the senate-house, threatening violence if he escaped the verdict of the senators. They had actually dragged Piso's statues to the Gemonian stairs, and were breaking them in pieces, when by the emperor's order they were rescued and replaced. Piso was then put in a litter, and attended by a tribune of one of the Praetorian cohorts, who followed him, so it was variously rumoured, to guard his person, or to be his executioner. Plancina was equally detested, but had stronger interest. Consequently, it was considered a question how far the emperor would be allowed to go against her. While Piso's hopes were in suspense, she offered to share his lot, whatever it might be, and in the worst event to be his companion in death. But as soon as she had secured her pardon through the secret intercessions of Augusta, she gradually withdrew from her husband, and separated her defence from his. When the prisoner saw that this was fatal to him, he hesitated whether he should still persist, but at the urgent request of his sons, braced his courage, and once more entered the senate. There he bore patiently the renewal of the accusation, the furious voices of the senators, savage opposition indeed from every quarter, but nothing daunted him so much as to see Tiberius, without pity and without anger, resolutely closing himself against any inroad of emotion. He was conveyed back to his house, where, seemingly by way of preparing his defence for the next day, he wrote a few words, sealed the paper, and handed it to a freedman. Then he bestowed the usual attention on his person. After a while, late at night, his wife having left his chamber, he ordered the doors to be closed, and at daybreak was found with his throat cut, and a sword lying on the ground. I remember to have heard old men say that a document was often seen in Piso's hands, the substance of which he never himself divulged, but which his friends repeatedly declared contained a letter from Tiberius with instructions referring to Germanicus, and that it was his intention to produce it before the Senate and upbraid the Emperor, had he not been deluded by vain promises from Sejanus. Nor did he perish, they said, by his own hand, but by that of one sent to be his executioner. Neither of these statements would I positively affirm, still it would not have been right for me to conceal what was related by those who lived up to the time of my youth. The emperor, assuming an air of sadness, complained in the senate that the purpose of such a death was to bring odium on himself, and he asked with repeated questionings how Piso had spent his last day and night. Receiving answers which were mostly judicious, though in part somewhat incautious, he read out a note written by Piso nearly to the following effect. Crushed by a conspiracy of my foes and the odium excited by a lying charge, since my truth and innocence find no place here, I call the immortal gods to witness that towards you, Caesar, I have lived loyally, 
and with like dutiful respect towards your mother, and I implore you to think of my children, one of whom, Clias, is in no way implicated in my career, whatever it may have been, seeing that all this time he has been at Rome, while the other, Marcus Piso, dissuaded me from returning to Syria. Would that I had yielded to my young son, rather than he to his aged father, and therefore I pray the more earnestly that the innocent may not pay the penalty of my wickedness. By forty-five years of obedience, by my association with you in the consulate, as one who formerly won the esteem of the divine Augustus, your father, as one who is your friend, and will never hereafter ask a favour, I implore you to save my unhappy son. About Plancina he added not a word. Tiberius after this acquitted the young Piso of the charge of civil war, on the ground that a son could not have refused a father's orders, compassionating at the same time the high rank of the family, and the terrible downfall even of Piso himself, however he might have deserved it. For Plancina he spoke with shame and conscious disgrace, alleging in excuse the intercession of his mother, secret complaints against whom from all good men were growing more and more vehement. So it was the duty of a grandmother, people said, to look a grandson's murderess in the face, to converse with her and rescue her from the Senate. What the laws secure on behalf of every citizen had to Germanicus alone been denied. The voices of a Vitellius and Varanius had bewailed a Caesar, while the Emperor and Augusta had defended Plancina. She might as well now turn her poisonings and her devices, which had proved so successful, against Agrippina and her children, and thus sate this exemplary grandmother and uncle with the blood of a most unhappy house. Two days were frittered away over this mockery of a trial, Tiberius urging Piso's children to defend their mother. While the accusers and their witnesses pressed the prosecution with rival zeal, and there was no reply, pity rather than anger was on the increase. Aurelius Cotter, the consul, who was first called on for his vote, for when the emperor put the question, even those in office went through the duty of voting, held that Piso's name ought to be erased from the public register, half of his property confiscated, half given up to his son Cnaeus Piso, who was to change his first name, that Marcus Piso, stripped of his rank, with an allowance of five million sesterces, should be banished for ten years, Plancina's life being spared in consideration of Augusta's intercession. Much of the sentence was mitigated by the emperor. The name of Piso was not to be struck out of the public register, since that of Marcus Antonius, who had made war on his country, and that of Julius Antonius, who had dishonoured the house of Augustus, still remained. Marcus Piso, too, he saved from degradation, and gave him his father's property, for he was firm enough, as I have often related, against the temptation of money, and now for very shame at Plancina's acquittal he was more than usually merciful. Again, when Valerius Messalinus and Cicinus Severus proposed respectively the erection of a golden statue in the temple of Mars the Avenger, and of an altar to vengeance, he interposed, protesting that victories over the foreigner were commemorated with such monuments, but that domestic woes ought to be shrouded in silent grief. There was a further proposal of Messalinus that Tiberius, Augusta, Antonia, Agrippina, and Drusus ought to be publicly thanked for having avenged Germanicus. He omitted all mention of Claudius. Thereupon he was pointedly asked by Lucius Asprinus before the Senate whether the omission had been intentional, and it was only then that the name of Claudius was added. For my part, the wider the scope of my reflection on the present and the past, 
the more am I impressed by their mockery of human plans in every transaction. Clearly, the very last man marked out for empire by public opinion, expectation, and general respect, was he whom fortune was holding in reserve as the emperor of the future. End of Book 3, Part 1 Recording by Graham Redman